Hello. Hello, Dr. Richard Grossman. This is he. Thank you for appearing on the Sea Realm podcast. Although I guess appearing is uh, probably not the right verb for a audio medium like this. Yeah. <laughs> Richard, close um, enough. Given the experiences that you and I have shared, uh, we didn't share them at the same time, but we both have similar points of reference, I know that this won't bother you. Uh, we're going to play with time a little bit. I'm speaking to you on my laptop, which has got a lousy battery in and is not plugged into uh, an adapter. I'm sitting in my truck in a parking lot, squatting on uh, somebody's Wi-Fi network. The conversation will end when the battery dies. So what I'd like to do now is thank you very much for having appeared on the Sea Realm podcast, and I wish you'd come back and talk to us sometime in the future. I would be happy to. Great. So now I'm going to take that and put it at the end uh, wherever the conversation leaves off. Okay. So, you are a practitioner of, of uh, healing arts of uh, several varieties. Would you tell us a bit about those and how you came to that profession? Sure. Um, initially, my, my background educationally is through acupuncture and Chinese medicine, traditional Chinese medicine. I've been practicing that for, oh boy, well over 20 years now. And prior to that, I had a background in, you know, different types of body work, nutritional work. I was a macrobiotic chef for a while and came to, came to healing through my own personal illness when I was eight, in my late teens, where I was able to experience the healing work of a wonderful old, older woman. She was in her 70s. And uh, she helped me get better, basically, using herbs and diet and nutrition. And that caused me to become instantly fascinated by that particular way of healing. I came into sound healing oh, about 10, 15 years ago when very, very accidentally, very <laughs> synchronistically, I picked up a Tibetan bell that happened to be sitting in my office from another doctor and played it over a patient and saw the deep effect that that had on the patient. So that got me quite interested in sound healing, and via the sound healing path and via some other circumstances in my life, I became very interested in shamanistic healing work. And where did that interest in shamanism take you? Um, it took me deeper into the sound work, for one, and it's also taking me down to the Amazon a couple times to work with indigenous shamans there. And basically, it's changed my individual practice quite a bit to where I much more rely on my own intuitive feelings of what's going on with patients and also will combine the traditional oriental medicine along with various aspects of particularly Peruvian shamanism of using different incenses or different scents and different instruments to help induce a healing trance state in the patient as I'm working on them and to work on them as in a in a dualistic approach of of using the acupuncture plus the shamanism which is pretty unusual I think how do you combine the acupuncture and the shamanism well, when I'm, when I'm working on a patient, I will initially do my traditional oriental diagnoses of pulse and tongue and face and questions and stuff to figure out what direction the person needs uh, in the acupuncture world, in the herbal world, perhaps even in the nutritional world. And as I'm working on, on the person with the acupuncture, I just start tuning in to different levels of where, I, where I'm uh, perceiving the patient as being. And then I'll choose different instruments to use according to what I'm perceiving using, using muscle testing sometimes to determine exactly what the person needs. And as I'm doing the music, I'm just really tuning in into what's been called uh, the other worlds or the shamanistic world to explore deeper levels of what, what the person might need. I might do some energy clearing. I might just say certain things at certain times to the person that I'm picking up that they need to hear, um, etc. I also 
take people down into Peru, into the Amazon, and into the Andean highlands to work with indigenous shamans. Uh, that's that's what I'm calling my heart feather experience. It's based on the concept of uh, from Egyptian um, Egyptian culture of the feather of Maat, where at the point of death a person's heart is weighed against a feather for Maat's headdress, and if their heart weighs more than the feather, then they're not given entrance into the afterlife or into heaven. So the idea behind these these journeys and using the shamanistic healing is that we all carry so much, so many wounds and so much stuff from our, you know, history of our life and traumas. And I just found the shamanistic work to be the most powerful way of releasing that, helping people be free. Now, so far, you have mentioned uh, trips to Peru. You've mentioned shamanism and healing. But you haven't mentioned something that I think listeners of this podcast will be keenly interested to hear about, and that's ayahuasca. Right. Ayahuasca. The mother. <laughs> ayahuasca is what I do take people down to Peru to experience, that and the San Pedro cactuses in the highlands of Peru. And for me, ayahuasca is, I don't know, the supreme healer in many ways, or the deepest healing tool that I have yet experienced and worked with. Uh, the ayahuasca gives entrance in such a profound and beautiful way into healing states that I personally, and I'm coming from 25, 30 years of experience in the healing world, personally have not found in any other way. Let me ask you some an opinion about the plant sure. mixture of the Banisteriopsis vine, the ayahuasca vine, and then whatever admixture plant one chooses to add to the ayahuasca to include the DMT. Uh, in and around Iquitos, where I know we've both been, uh, Chaliponga is a, a common admixture plant, as is uh, Brugmansia. And I get the sense that the ayahuasca vine in and of itself, even though it doesn't have any chemical composition to it that's going to give you visions or cause hallucinations, uh, still has a unique spirit, a unique identity that comes through in the ayahuasca experience. And I say that because I've been to the Amazon twice now seeking visionary experiences. I've gone there wanting the the visions of Pablo Amaringo to, you know, be in front of my mind's eye when I close my eyelids, and that never happened. But of the 12 or 15 times that I've taken ayahuasca, the next day, every single day, I have felt so integrated in my body, and I have just felt so at ease and so right with the world. And that, I, I get the experience, or I get the feeling that that comes from the vine itself. And I was wondering if you had any opinions about uh, the individual components of the ayahuasca and how they might be different in their effects on us and how they might have their own unique identities and how that might get expressed in sound. Well, last year I spent time in Ecuador with the Mami Acta family uh, in Mariposa. And that question came up several times. And the understanding, well, first off, I mean, to to look at the Amazon, for anybody who's never been there, you know, we walk through maybe a North American or European forest, and it's pretty tame, you know. It's tame. I mean, I, I live under in an oak, old oak forest here, and I'm looking around, and there's oak trees, there's bay laurel trees, there's a sycamore tree down the way. And every winter we get a lot of different plants popping up. But you walk into an Amazonian rainforest and there's more species of plants in, you know, an acre than there are in North America. And each acre has different species living in it. And the profusion of plants and life and the wildness of it is something that until you experience it is incomprehensible. Each tree has hundreds if not thousands of different beings living on it, different plants and different animals. 
And if you take this idea of mixing these two plants together, how did they figure that out? The odds are millions times millions times millions a million times against any two herbs coming together in a formula and then how do you cook it and all that. So the question came up of how did they figure out how to combine these different plants together. What 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 the idea is and you know this goes back probably thousands of years is that initially people did just use the vine and the vine provided provides a tremendous healing to it and provides a tremendous way of connecting into the plant world just by the vine alone and in fact sometimes people will just drink the vine without without the admixtures and what they said was that the vine taught them which plants to use with it, or told them which plants to use with it. How that translates into our North American experience, I, I don't yet know. But I would imagine, you know, you look at a plant when you're on the vine and, and you get a feeling for it. You get a, oh, well, this would be, you know, this one wants to work together with this other one. So what they what they told me is that the vine is the healer, the vine is the mother, the vine is what connects you into the spirit world and the admixtures turn on the light that lets you see that so as far as brugmansia goes they do use that some of the mestizos use that in the um, iquitos area and other parts of the peruvian and brazilian amazon but uh, i haven't i haven't experienced that yet and i don't know that i want to for a while very powerful medicine let me ask you about the so-called North American ayahuasca, the mixture of uh, psilocybin mushrooms with uh, some sort of MIO inhibitor like ayahuasca, say the Syrian root seeds. Have you experienced that? Mm -hmm. I did when I first started exploring this path, and it's a very powerful vision. It's much more visionary to me than, than the ayahuasca Chakruna and Chalipanga combinations, much more, uh, much more in the way of visuals. Uh, once I once I actually tried the traditional ayahuasca, the I, I lost my interest in pursuing those other admixtures. What are your thoughts? And I, I want to get to sound very quickly here, so this will be the last non-sound related question I ask. Uh, what are your thoughts on the effects of an ayahuasca tourism industry on the cultures? that that industry depends upon? Good question. My, my students are that are mixed, especially since I'm technically part of that industry now because I do take groups down there for big money and provide them an experience of indigenous shamanism. It's mixed in that it is changing the culture. It is creating a competitive atmosphere, especially in the Iquitos area of, um, you know, my shaman's better than your shaman and all of that. And on the other hand, I think it may be the key to preserving that culture because many, most of the young people that I've run into in, in Peru and Ecuador, like when I was in Ecuador, we met some younger people who said, what are you guys doing here? And we said, oh, we're here to drink ayahuasca. And they said, oh, that's for the old people. What are you doing that for? And I think making ayahuasca tourism something that's viable down there will do many things that are good for the culture as well. Number one, tourism is one of the main ways of bringing money into that area. It's a very impoverished area. And if you take any given piece of land down there, the land down there is used for lumber. It's basically cut and clear uh, techniques of getting lumber out of there. Uh, and then, you know, either doing it for pasturing for animals or putting up chicken farms or just leaving it to turn into barren land. When you have money going in for tourists who want a jungle experience, it encourages many of the shamans who are now making money to buy pieces of land and preserve them and keep them in a natural state or even you know, take the old lands that have been clear-cut and 
make them into more of a natural jungle environment and really steward the land in a way that makes it uh, a nice place for tourists to go to. And also I'm finding, I found especially lesson that there are more young people that are interested in learning the medicine because they're starting to recognize that this is a way they can, you know, not be in poverty and not have to work for, you know, 50 cents or a dollar a day in some hard labor job. So I think if, if the um, northerners go down there with discernment and with really looking for an authentic experience, I think it's good for the culture. You know, we have this kind of romantic idea that the indigenous culture should stay exactly the same as they were or as they are now, and that hasn't been the case since the Spaniards arrived in South America. It's always been changing. There's a Catholic influence. There's a modern influence. There, there's, there's a lot of things that are going on there. There's a Buddhist influence in some ways. There's a lot of things going on there now that are very syncretic and very much of a combination of different cultures. So I look at it in the short run as being somewhat of a danger, but in the long run is probably being quite beneficial. Well, Richard, I did not mean to set the question up as uh, sort of demanding that you justify your, your practices of taking groups down there. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad to have on record your, your very full and expressive answer to my question, because it, it is an issue that I myself grapple with. So let's talk about sound and the potential for sound for healing and the potential for sound for uh, being a means of changing consciousness. Um, in episode four of the Sea Realm podcast, we talked to uh, a friend of mine named David Rosteicher, a.k.a. the Zip Code Man, about his experiences down in South America, particularly with ayahuasca. And he mentioned that uh, when he was under the influence of ayahuasca, he could sing like an opera singer. Now, I expect that most people who've never done ayahuasca who hear that just in interpret that to mean that when he was out of his brain on this crazy drug, he had the delusion that he could sing really well. Well, in fact, he was probably croaking like a frog. Uh, I tend to believe him. I think that when he was drinking ayahuasca, he probably could sing in an amazing way. I think probably everyone can. And ayahuasca triggers that in us. That's certainly my experience with it. Yeah. We are musical beings. You know, in the past, before we commercialized music so much, families would sit around the fireplace or the campfire and sing. And they'd make music. And there wasn't this idea of, oh, yes, I'm a professional, I get to sing. And you're not a professional, you don't get to sing. You know, that was not part of the even, you know, remote concept. And, well, my experience with ayahuasca and music is I consider ayahuasca my teacher of music. I've learned, <laughs> I was talking to a friend yesterday, she said I was, at a, at a memorial for a, a friend of mine, and, and this woman happened to be there who's a profound musician, and there was a drum next to me, and she said, oh, do you play the drum? And I said, no, I'm rhythmically challenged. I, I'm amazed I get away with being a musician, because I can't keep a beat. And, but yet when, I'm, when I take the medicine, I'll take one of my instruments, say a jaws harp, which I have played in a certain manner, and on the medicine, what comes through me is, and I, you know, I've actually recorded this or, or heard recordings of me playing. What comes through me is music on a level that I didn't know that I could perform at. I can sing. I mean, I, I, I also, you know, I had the famous fifth grade music teacher, Mrs. Sims, who, when I started singing in class, said, well, you stand at the back and don't ever sing again. Just mouth the words. You have a horrible voice. <laughs> and so many people have had a Mrs. Sims or some variety thereof. And, you know, we're afraid to sing. We're afraid to open up our mouths and let the spirit flow through us. And ayahuasca, the spirit and the medicine, loves music, just adores music, adores to hear people open their mouth and let these amazing melodies come through. 
and and so I think that your friend is probably right. He probably could sing like an opera singer on the ayahuasca. He can probably sing like an opera singer without it too. But we filter our spirit. We filter our abilities so much in our ordinary realities. Yeah, we have our inner critic and the outer critics. Uh, let's talk about the the power songs, the Icaros of the the shamans in Peru and elsewhere. What has been your experience with that? They're magic. They are they are true magic in the highest and most beautiful sense of the word magic. Um, when when the shaman sings, he's providing several things depending on the skill of the shaman. He's providing, or she's providing, of course. I will use he just for the ease of use at this point, because most of the shamans down there are men, but I've certainly been with women shamans down there who are extraordinary singers as well. But he's providing a pathway through the territory. When a person takes the medicine, they are blown open to everything. And the Ikaro provides the trail or the pathway through that territory, through the experience and wisdom that the shaman is able to carry. And the Ikaros are, sometimes they're learned, uh, especially in the Shipibo culture. Many of the Ikaros are traditional songs that they learn from their teachers or the shaman who teaches them. Uh, many of them just kind of sprout up spontaneously as the medicine asks the person to sing. Uh, one of my, one of my <laughs> most beautiful experiences with an Ikaro occurred last year when I was down there. Actually, this summer when I was down there, I had, as you know, the environment around Iquitos is, or in Iquitos, is pretty horrible as far as diesel fumes and pollution Boys goes. Pollution. And I'd spent a couple of weeks, yeah, I'd spent a couple of weeks there and had acquired a pretty good case of bronchitis. And then I went into the mountains, fell asleep with my blankets off in Cusco and got totally chilled and the dryness of that air and everything gave me a darn good case of a hacking cough. So I went back down to the jungle during one of the ceremonies. I was, I felt like I was going into asthma, an asthmatic attack. I could barely breathe. I was coughing like mad. And the shaman called me to the, up to him and sang a song to me. When I went back to sit down in my place, I took a deep breath, no congestion, no mucus, no coughing, no tickle in my throat nothing. It was all gone, which continued into the next day. And I asked him what he did, and he just really simply and very sweetly said, I sang a song to your lungs. Yeah. You know, that's interesting to hear that, to hear you describe him as being sweet and humble and not uh, self-aggrandizing in the telling of the fact that he had just healed you. I've, my first experience in South America, I was utterly shocked by the hubris of so many of the shamans and the self-importance. Um, the first time that I experienced Toe or Brugmancia, it was uh, on an ayahuasca jungle retreat, but you know we were taking a night off from ayahuasca, and this uh, vegetalista came in, and his specialty was the Toe plant, and he had the long, white, trumpet-shaped flowers with him, which were so beautiful, and he was a very short man with white hair, and a wizened smile and just a glow and an energy about him and he seemed so sweet and well-mannered and when he he spent the day preparing the medicine and then as he was addressing us he was going to dispense it uh, there was a translator speaking for him and he said I am a very well-known shaman researchers from North America have come here and spoken to me and I have given them my wisdom and they took that wisdom back to the United States and they put it in a book which costs one hundred dollars and that was his introduction to him and his position in relation to us, and it just seems so ridiculous. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad to hear you talk about uh, some humility among the shamans, because I think that is one aspect that their particular profession seems uh, lacking in. I'd agree with that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real issue down there, and it's something that I, I basically have learned to have some degree of caution with, like if somebody's too bristic, I won't work with them at all just because it, it, it bugs me. But uh, it's also just part of the the way that things work in, in that part of the world. There's a lot of uh, 
shamanic competition going on, a lot of shamanic warfare going on down there that I think at some point will have to be worked with. I know that um, Alan Shoemaker down there is working on getting together the different shamans in the Iquitos area to develop a code of ethics and you know, a way of working with people where that stuff won't be as much of an issue, hopefully. Well, that seems to be one argument in favor of going down with a tour group with a group leader that is familiar with the area. Because the first time I went down to South America, it was with uh, Luis Eduardo Luna. He was leading the group. And he would bring in ceremonial healers and ceremony leaders to, uh, in my opinion, just provide atmosphere. They would come and they would sing their Icaros, but there's a very predatory streak in many of the local practitioners, and Luis Eduardo would be there to interrupt and to run interference between the shamans who might take a predatory interest in their clientele and the people who have paid to come to this environment which is totally alien and exotic to them and in which they are utterly defenseless. So I, I really would advise people who are going into the situation uh, with no prior experience of South America or traveling in the third world to go with a group and to have somebody with them that knows what's going to happen and can be a, a protector when a protector is needed. I think that's that's so wise and so important. Um, you know, a lot of their stories, many stories of gringos getting off the airport and getting into a taxi cab and the taxi cab driver says, what are you here for? And they say, oh, I'm here to try ayahuasca. And the taxi cab driver says, oh, I know the best person here. And he takes them to somebody who gives them, you know, toe or, you know, some bad medicine. And they go nuts. You know, the, the horror stories abound of these things. And you are going into a third world country. You are going into a very foreign environment. And to have somebody who knows the territory help you through it makes what could be a dangerous experience you know, much more pleasant and much safer. Well, let's talk more about sound and how it can change consciousness, even in the absence of something, some external element like ayahuasca or psilocybin. I think it's important to, to recognize that all music and all sound creates altered states of consciousness, uh, desired or undesired. Even listening to the romantic music of, for example, Frank Sinatra creates an altered state of consciousness. Uh, what we're looking for, what I'm looking for when I do my sound work, though, is creating an altered state of consciousness for healing and for journey work and for transformation. I don't don't work with medicine up here um, mainly because it's illegal for me to do that. So I, I do my medicine work in the yeah. I'm, I'm a do, I'm an acupuncturist, and it's not part of my relationship to give people psychedelics, you know. So. I, I say that for the trips down to South America. But what I've tried to create in the work that I do is the same type of altered state of consciousness or a similar state that the medicines take a person to. So as I'm doing my work on either an individual person or in a concert type setting, I'm part of my part of my attention is on the instruments, but not a very large part of it. Most of my attention is on what's going on in the person or people that I'm working with at the moment. So I, I do, I'm not even sure how I do this, but I, I can feel what's going on in the audience. And, and when I perform, people are sitting, they're lying down, closed eyes. So there's not like cheering and stuff that's going on. I would, that would really bother me. <laughs> uh, but I, I can feel what's going on there. And occasionally, well, the music might be beautiful. It might be intense it might be scary but I'm really trying to feel where people are at like if I feel that somebody is going through a negative experience I watch almost as an observer as the music might become kind of scary kind of really science fiction me and intense and some people might start you know shaking a little bit or you know I can see them kind of come out of the trance state a little bit but I tell people before I start to stay with it, you know, if something comes up that's negative, the music's not creating it, it's coming from inside of you, and it's coming up for healing. So I am, I am quite aware of what's going on in the people as I'm, as I'm performing. Let me ask you about heavy music that is sort of science fiction-y and uh, wrought with uh, sensation of suspense or anxiety, because you sent me two tracks. 
Uh, one was the Realm of the Cosmic Serpent, which I absolutely love and listen to all the time now. And the other was a track called Primal Heart. And I have to say, Primal Heart rubs me the wrong way, and I find it rather oppressive. And I've tried to listen to it a couple times and turned it off. And when I asked you to send me two tracks, I said, send me one that we'll listen to and one that we'll use as background uh, to give some atmosphere behind our conversation. And I tell you, I, w I won't use Primal Heart for atmosphere <laughs> because I think it would really uh, create a state of mind for a lot of listeners that I don't want to create for them. You know, people have different... Everybody everybody loves Realm of the Cosmic Serpent. It's To me, it's it's definitely the most beautiful music that has uh, that I've created so far. One of the most beautiful pieces I've created. It's just uh, I, I love it. The primal heart. People have different different reactions to. I've had people say that they listen to it over and over and over and over again because they love it. It takes them really deep. And other people find the gong to be oppressive. Uh, it's just. Just uh, maybe neural chemistry or different experiences that different sounds have created for people. Um, I do find the gong to be the most powerful instrument that I work with, as far as evoking states of both ecstasy and of its opposites. So when I do the gong work, there's usually a number of different phases that it goes through. Every place from oh my god, I want to get out of here to you know, mandalas of dancing devils to utter spiritual ecstasy. Just people have different experiences with that particular instrument. I think it's a, a Rorschach ink blot of instruments in a way where wherever a person is at or uh, whatever experiences they've had in their life, it'll reflect that for them. And I'm not saying that, you know, you have an oppressive nature or anything, but, you know, it's just, it's just different strokes, you know different strokes. So what I'd like to do now is thank you very much for having appeared on the Sea Realm Podcast, and I wish you'd come back and talk to us sometime in the future. I would be happy to. Great. 